Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. This week at Safeway, shop the 10 for $10 produce sale. With the 10 for $10 produce sale, get items like large avocados, mangoes, green, red, orange, or yellow bell peppers, cucumbers, large lemons, or 16-ounce bags of Signature Farms baby-peeled carrots for the member price of just a dollar each. Plus, select meats like Signature Farms 80% lean ground beef and Signature Select extra meaty pork loin back ribs are buy one, get one free this week. Hurry in before these deals are gone. Visit Safeway.com for more deals. Oscast. Hello, Nest family. Welcome to the show for another week. You're probably all a little bit tired and flat. Well, certainly we are at the time of this recording because it was a late night watching the Eagles go down narrowly to Melbourne in the end despite a late fight back but uh, a loss nonetheless which leaves us fighting for our finals chances maybe that doesn't matter too much to a lot of you which is understandable but uh, that's the predicament as it is right now looking forward to breaking all of that down and plenty more with uh, the man from Tokyo who is now back on Australian shores and in quarantine in Drewy Jones Drewy has hotel life mate Hello, Gabby. Yeah, just settling in uh, here in Melbourne. Um, it was supposed to be in Adelaide, but a few complications leaving Tokyo. So, um, yeah, back down under. Um, I can revert back to G'day Mates instead of uh, Konnichiwa in Ohio. Um, but, yeah, it's nice to be back after a really great couple of weeks, but I'm ready to get stuck back into the footy. Good stuff. The, the Olympics were unbelievable, just magnificent. We'll get some of your recollections, your best moments from Tokyo and some insights into your experiences at the end of the podcast. We'll save that for later. Uh, we'll touch on the Demons in a moment and we'll get into the game shortly. But I wanted to start with some big news that broke just after we recorded the podcast last week, Drewy, that I want to touch on before we get into the game because it's more important than wins and losses. And that is the... I'll say in a sporting sense, in a sporting sense, the tragic retirement of Daniel Venables. Not in a life sense because he's got his health, thankfully, and that's why he's given away the game. But in a sporting sense, it is a tragic loss on a personal level and for the club. Um, It's just so sad, isn't it, that after playing in a premiership at 19 years of age and 21 games all up, a first-round draft pick has had to call it quits because of one big hit. Yeah, it's really sad. And um, I think everyone just feels for Daniel Venables. Uh, but I don't feel for him as much about the retirement. I just feel for him because what he's been through has just been really traumatic um, as far as the way that he's described it. Uh, and it's best for him to retire. I think probably deep down we all knew that that was the right thing for Venables to do. Uh, and if you you listen to him speak about you know, the un- ongoing issues that he has with concussion um, due to that hit he got against, ironically, uh, Melbourne at Optus Stadium uh, a few years ago. Uh, West Coast looks like have, have done whatever they can to support him. They've kept him on the list. They've um, allowed him to, to stay around the club or to spend time with family as much as possible. So uh, an, an independent AFL medical p- panel actually ruled unanimously that uh, he should retire. So after the, all, all that work that he's put in to try and get himself back to playing footy, um, I guess he put sort of put his concussion protocols to the test uh, and unfortunately they haven't come through. That's actually the doorbell, Garby. I might have had dinner delivered. Just bet, you, just, you talk about Daniel Venables and live – Breaking on the podcast, let me go see what I've got for dinner. This is what quarantine life is all about. So for people who haven't experienced it, I haven't experienced it in that sense. I imagine when the doorbell rings for dinner, it's damn important because you can't exactly go outside to the supermarket and uh, and pick up your meal for the night. You've got to make sure you get it when it's ready or else you go hungry. Um, I'll touch on Venables while Drewy gets his food. Yeah, I mean, when he got copped that hit against the Ds, I mean, you just didn't think for a second that would be the end of his career. That would be the last time that he'd step on a football field. I mean, guys have done knees three times, three ACLs, and managed to eke out a career at the end. 
you just thought, you know, he's out for a couple of weeks, maybe with bad concussion, and then he'll be back. Daniel Venables, what an important part of the Eagles moving forward. But it ended just like that, an AFL career taken away. And it's so sad. And yes, the most important thing is that he'll be able to have his brain functioning. And I'm sure he'll still have some issues as life goes on. But it's just such a huge disappointment for him and for the club. You know, we talk a lot about our list and where it's at. And you know, the lack of first round draft picks. And is there enough youth coming through? I mean, Daniel Venables played in the premiership. He may have been the 21st or 22nd player in that team, but he still was part of that group and picked on that day to make a contribution. Maybe he didn't do much on grand final day, but after we lost to the Demons, I'll be honest, I was having some banter as I often do with my Melbourne supporting friends and they were giving me some sticks. So I did what I always do and got the YouTube highlights out of the 2018 prelim and sent it to them and then ended up watching it. And I tell you what, in the seven minutes highlights package that is on YouTube, Daniel Venables features prominently. There's like three or four solid inside and under plays where he's just giving off a handball, setting up others, looks so quick in his decision-making. I mean, he would have been such an important player for us now and the exact player that we need, a midfielder who can go forward with some zip, kick some goals, you know, young effervescent player coming through, first round draft pick that could hopefully be an elite player in the competition. And we lost him just like that. It's, it's really disappointing for the team. His health is by far and away the most important thing, but it's just a a real sporting tragedy, no doubt, and, and a huge loss for the club. And it, and it leaves a void on the playing list, Drew. Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Uh, dinner sorted. Uh, chicken and rice. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's you made a really good point. Um, he was playing out of position uh, in the grand final and through that run because of how strong the team was. But such was the, uh, the coaching staff and the selection committee's respect for what he brought to the team they were happy to, to play him as a pressure forward, even though he was an in, in and under midfielder. So uh, people have spoken about it since, but he had showed a lot of the capabilities and potential that Luke Shuey showed. Uh, and it's not just the hairline that's all, almost uh, exactly the same. It's He was tough in the clinches with that explosive element to his game as well. So, I mean, if you, if you could pick out ex- exactly what we've needed this season... It's basically that. It would have been someone who's tough inside but has also got an ability to spread away from a contest. Uh, And and so it is very sad that West Coast haven't been able to use Daniel Venables the way that he was always meant to play. You know, like we never got to see him flourish as an AFL player. Uh, And that's, that's sad for any young player that comes into the AFL system, but particularly because it was completely out of Daniel's control. You know, he got hit in a marking contest, uh, looked like he was sort of going back with the flight to an extent. Um, and, you know, some some guys just bounce back up and they never think about that incident again and he just got hit in the wrong spot. And that, that can happen. And um, the most important thing is that he lives, you know, the fullest life possible. And when you, you've listened, I'm sure everyone listening has also have watched the chat that Venus does with Stephen Bandy. Uh, on the Eagles' website, and the fact that, you know, some days he would wake up and he'd feel crappy and he'd go for a run and then he'd feel good, and then some days he'd wake up and he'd feel good, he'd go for a run and then he'd feel crappy. You know, it's a great example of how unpredictable and how confusing uh, it would have been this entire period for him. Yeah, Luke Shuey, I saw called him mini-me on um, on Instagram. They, they were so similar in their style and their look. Yeah, that's what we were hoping for, and maybe we would have got its... Um, it sucks in that sense, but he'll always be an Eagle for life and he'll always be a premiership player. And there aren't too many AFL players, never mind West Coast Eagles, that can say that. So he'll always have that attached to him, which is very special. And uh, he'll always be one of us. So thank you, Daniel Venables, for your contribution. We'll miss you dearly, but uh, the right decision has been made for you <laughs> and your life moving forward. Well, let's make a pack. If you ever see Daniel Venables, whether it's uh, around Perth or in Melbourne, you know, buy him a beer or a coffee and, and say, well done, you know, I'm being a premiership player, I'll never forget you because yeah. he will need every bit of support along the way. So he's an eagle for life, so make sure we uh, keep him part of the family. Well said, agree with that. All right, let's get on to the Demons then and the game last night. You know, I think all in all we would be satisfied with, with the performance. Certainly the resurgence late, 
I wouldn't say it, it covers up the game at all because the football's four quarters. The delay changed things enormously, but we responded really well, played some excellent footy there. Maybe that sets the tone for the, the end to the season and played with a lot more freedom, which I think Eagles fans enjoyed and the players seemed to enjoy. You know, in the end, we served it up to a premiership fancy, arguably the premiership favourite. So a tick in that sense, I guess the only knock, Drew, is that once again, when momentum went against us, we failed to stop it. And that cost us in the end. That was the difference at the end of the game, that third quarter. We can talk about some umpiring decisions in a moment, and I certainly want to, and in more detail, the response from opposition fans towards Eagles fans, which I think is out of control right now. But ultimately, that's why we lost the game. We let them just run over us in the third quarter and didn't hold that momentum. Yeah, I thought we did a pretty good job through the first half at sort of collaring Melbourne a little bit. Um, And they haven't been an amazing first half team, generally speaking, throughout the season. They've, they've normally done the damage after the main break. And, and I guess that's what happened to an extent in the third quarter. But the endeavour was there. Like There wasn't too many times where I was disgusted and looked away from the TV or, you know, I guess the feelings of previous weeks, mm. they didn't resurface. And, you know, uh, there was some probably co- some concerns from West Coast fans going into the game about the conditions and, and whether we would you know, turn our toes up to an extent because it didn't really suit our style. But, um, you know, we absolutely got stuck in. Um, we were tough around the ball. And, and that's all you want to see, really. You know, that's what Melbourne pride themselves on. And I thought, while we didn't absolutely, you know, beat them or maybe even match them in that area, we at least gave them a really good contest and we gave them a bit of a scare. Obviously, the break worked for us and maybe they went into their shells a little bit. But uh, once we evened up the numbers all over the grounds um, and tried to play some more expansive and fast-moving footy, um, we looked really good. So a yeah. question of emulating that uh, throughout the entire game, um, I guess, is that's the next step forward. And perhaps against a, a slightly inferior opposition, it, that's a bit easier to do. But considering where we're at right now and where Melbourne are heading this season, um, I think overall the performance was was pretty promising. Yeah, we matched them in the midfield for, for large parts of the game. They, they have a bit more class in the midfield and a bit more zip. I think that's our issue is, you know, Yoey and Kelly give us a bit of that, but Sheed and Gaff, we've spoken about it, maybe a bit heavy-legged. We really miss Luke Shuey in that sense. But you looked, looked at a couple of the link-ups, Oliver to Petraka to Harms. They just move the ball and move themselves just that little bit quicker. And we just couldn't keep up in that sense. But overall, our grit and intensity was really strong. I think we liked that. Um, Defensively, we made some mistakes, but overall, we seem to have better synergy down back. A couple of guys, a little bit down in form. Brad Shepard seems to be, you know, quite at his best. Harry Edwards got beaten by Ben Brown. He's a good forward. He played well. You know, Harry's had some good games, had some good moments, but overall, lowered his colours. It looked like McGovern really held us together at the back, which was pleasing. And then up forward again, it just it's not quite clicking, but good signs. I mean, Josh Kennedy had a good game. Jamie Cripps a good game. Um, you know, Darling and Allen, you're thinking, geez, they've been really poor. And then in the last quarter, they flick it like that, and you think maybe they got their confidence back now. That's promising going into the Frio game. So, yeah, I mean, all in all, I think you're satisfied, and you're thinking, all right, we can knock off the Dockers now next week and start to build maybe towards the finals. And maybe that last quarter, even though Melbourne – really came out half-hearted and we're just waiting for the siren to go. Maybe that can set the tone. Maybe they can say, all right, that's how we've got to play now. It's a bit more dare with a bit more excitement about us and and we can actually do something with our talent in the running when we get Luke Shuey and, and Liam Ryan and Tom Barras back this week. Yeah, it was nice to see that West Coast weren't the passive one. Yeah. You know, like, that's not, it's normally the other way. It's normally... Yeah. But Melbourne looked like us. They looked so easy to play against in that last 20 minutes. And we moved the ball crisply and hit a few passes. Um, So, yeah, look, at this stage, you're just looking for any little positives. You know, that's that's how far we've fallen in the last few weeks. So to see Oscar Allen get his hands on the footy a couple of times, to see Jack Darling starting to clunk a few marks again, like they're all little positive signs. Jamie Cripps continuing pretty good form up forward. You know, there was a couple of times where we looked like a, a functioning back six, even with Shannon Hearn going out of the, the you know out of the game with a, a slight hamstring. I thought Witherden was okay. A couple of times he 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 dropped 
back into space and took marks, which is a really pleasing thing to see. Like, you know, we know he was brought into the team because of what he can do with the ball in hand offensively, but to see him do some defensive stuff yeah. um, was good. Um, I mean, I guess we've got to, we've got to put the Hutchings inclusion down as a win. So yeah. it suited the conditions. Clearly the game, you know, was made for, for Hutchings, but, but they got it right in terms of Garby, not just putting him in the midfield as the tagger, they were starting him as a forward and then he drifted in and they got that right. Um, so we had the extra number around the ball, but Hutchings did a good job on Oliver. Like, there's been a few times this season that I've watched Melbourne. In fact, maybe even more than a few. I watch the D's a lot. And there's been times where I've thought, geez, Clayton Oliver is almost the best player in the competition. Like, there's times where he looks unreal. Um, and he didn't have one of those games. No. He didn't He didn't feel like he ever got the game on his terms. So he got 28 possessions, but I didn't think they were that effectual. So I think yeah. Hutchings almost got the points. Yeah, I mean, he, he only had 400 odd metres gained, which tells you a lot because he couldn't damage us with his possessions. Now, he got nine clearances, but a lot of those would have been at centre bounces. I saw Ashley Little on Twitter said, why didn't Hutch start at the centre bounce? I don't mind that. You can only have three in there. We've got some big names. I reckon you put Yo, Kelly and Sheed in and you back our boys to win it rather than playing a tagger in there. And then straight after the centre bounce, you say, all right, now Hutch, you go to Oliver and you stop him winning it around the ground and you stop him winning it at stoppages. I think that's a sound tactic. So, yeah, he got nine clearances, but a lot of those were when Hutch wasn't on him. And again, he didn't really damage us that much. Um, So, yeah, I thought it was a win and I think it's the way forward. I think you just take Hutch and you put him on the best ball winner in the opposition whether it's Adam Chera or Brayshaw this week, if he gets off, we don't know at the time of recording. We'll know in a few hours. Um, you know, next week it might be Lockie Neal or, or Dane Zorko or Jared Lyons against Brisbane. Stop it at the source. And that's his best job because if you put him on Petrarca, he gets beaten on the outside. Track goes, all right, you know, Clayton, you win the stoppage. I'll, I'll come out of this contest a little bit. I'll get two metres on him within two seconds because I'm just quicker than him. So... I think that's the best way to play Hutch, just negate his weaknesses, which is pace, and play to his strengths, which is contest, body-on-body body stuff, and just play him inside on the on the source and, and stop it and then hope that we can win enough ball inside ourselves and, and on the outside and, and start to even up the midfield battle where we've been beaten on too many occasions this season. So I think it's a sound tactic moving forward. I really hope they stick with it. You've hit the nail on the head there. So... Uh don't uh, expose your best players to the clearance situation. So if that's Kelly, Redden uh, and Yo at the centre bounce, give Nick Nat every chance to hit them. Yeah. And then Hutch comes in off off the line and jumps onto Oliver or whoever it's going to be. But you want to still be trying to win the game. So yes. win the game with Nick Nat and the clearances and then defend the game once the ball's you know, in dispute outside of the centre. So um, that was a good bit of coaching. You know, we've got to give credit to Simo where it's due. He's had some big swings and misses, but this was really good. And now it looks like Hutchings is actually match fit and ready to play AFL again. So that means that this week, you know, they can prob- probably chair. It just seems like the right move to me. Yeah. Um, he's been in great form recently and he hasn't been exposed to the tag too often. So give him something else to think about. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, if they roll that out again, and if Shuey plays, which we hope that he will, that again just is just another reason why you wouldn't have Hutchings starting inside the centre square because you're going to have another inside bull, you know, clearance specialist back in the team. So, you know, I I questioned a couple of the selection decisions going into the game, um, but I, you know, I was wrong on Hutchings. He was really good. Yeah. I liked it as well. I want to talk about the decision late in the game, um, which was a ridiculous one, and that was the non-50 that should have been paid to Jack. I mean, the 50 metres is paid there, Drewy. Jack Darling's kicking from probably 50 out with the wind behind him, with his confidence up. It's back to three points with 30 seconds to play. Um, so is this when Harrison Petty um, just oh, jumped around the ball and then yeah. like picked it up and sort of moved around? And yeah, like they have to change that rule. It's just, that's, it's, it's it just happens gut- every all the time. It's gutless umpiring. It's the umpire being scared to make a big call late in the game. I mean, it happens a lot of the time. Now, 
That's not the reason why we lost the game. We lost the game because we let them get away from us in the third quarter and we had too much to do. Um, but what annoys me is that uh, there's this narrative now around the Eagles at, at Optus that we just get a, a golden ride. And it's not true. And I'm so sick of opposition fans. Every single game we play at home going on about the Eagles getting a good ride from the umps. I don't think it's been that way for two, three years. I think we did for a little period of time. I'm not going to deny that. I reckon through the mid-2000s or whatever, even up to 2018, we probably did get a, a decent ride because the crowd's influential and we get some bad rides away from home as well because crowds play a part. But I reckon at Optus, we got a pretty good run for a little bit. And then you had the Alan Richardson noise of affirmation press conference and a lot of commentary and just like umpires are human, Drew, and respond to crowd, they're also human and respond to criticism from the outside. And I reckon they've changed that in recent times. I don't think we get a good run anymore. I don't think umpiring affects games at Optus that much like opposition fans would want you to believe. Yet they still go on about it. It's like the Eagles can't get a call, a debatable call, in a game of footy at home anymore or else the umps are cheating. I'm just sick of it. It's such nonsense. Oh, it's I, well, it's a myth, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It's a myth. And, you know, Alan Richardson, as much as I like the guy, he was just he was just pissed off because West Coast used to thump St Kilda every single time. Home away, rain, hail or shine. They were, all, they were a pretty mediocre team for the entire time after Richo and he was probably just sick of going over to the West and getting thumped. Ultimately... And that is part of being a home team is you might get just that 1% go your way. But, to th- but to, yeah, it, it's, it's always been way overplayed. Yeah. And umpires' influence on games gets talked about way too much anyway because it goes along with people just not being willing to blame their own team. They, they have to blame someone else. And so it, that, it, that narrative really shits me and I, I just don't like talking about umpiring decisions at all because my view is that they all even out. Um, yeah, and we got some we got some good ones last night. We got some bad ones. The D's got some handy ones. They got some bad ones. That wasn't the reason why a team won or lost the game. Um, my best is the old free kick counts. Oh, but the free kick count was 30 to 18. They are not meant to be even. <laughs> that defies all sense of logic, right? Yeah. <laughs> what? yeah. How are they meant to be even? One team puts his head over the ball and gets to the ball first, they are going to win more free kicks. That is just going to happen every single time, which is probably why we have a lot of free kicks in our history because we've been a successful team and a tough team. We might have got some lucky ones over the journey, but to spare me with all that crap, please. Yeah, it gives me the shits, to be quite honest. <laughs> anyway, we move on. Let's talk about the positives and go through the Nest Medal votes. Thank you to everyone who... Uh, who dished out their votes this week. We appreciate it. Quick turnaround, so we didn't get to uh, to all of them um, that you'll probably want to send through. But, uh, Drury, give us your five to one. I'll give my five to one, and then we'll go through the votes for this week and update the leaderboard. It gives us a time to talk about some of the positive players. Well, I just thought that um, Elliot Yo primed himself for this game, knowing he was coming up against you know, three of the toughest inside bulls that you'll find. And that, that was without Jack Viney even playing. But between Petraka, between Clayton Oliver and James Harms, who, I, who in my mind's underrated, mm. you know, there's three really tough midfielders there. And I think Yo sort of knew going into it that he was going to have to front up and, and be a presence. And I just think he was awesome. Um, he's been getting better and better. And I think that was probably his best performance. Um, since he's been back, just has to clean up his kicking a little bit. But he's not in the te- he's not in the team to to lace out every kick. He's in the team to be the you know the alpha dog in the midfield um, to do the hard things, do the tough things, and lead us. And I thought he did that really well. So five for me for Yo. I thought Nick Natnui, you know, he's just always good. Um, he was influential as we surge back back in the the fourth quarter. And I thought that him and Vardy. You know, they they limited Max Gorn's influence. Max still got his hands on the ball a bit, but didn't have a great game. His disposal, you know, wasn't he wasn't spot on um, when he had the ball. I thought that was due to Vardy and Nick working him over. So four for Nick. Tim Kelly, particularly early, I thought was really influential in helping to set the tone and us be in the game. Uh, and then 
I mean, I could have given him five just for that chase down tackle late on um, the little red nut um, from Bowie. Melbourne, cl- close to goal. Um, yeah, Bowie p- drags him down. Great pressure to see uh, you know to see Kelly doing that, and then uh, Connor West kicking his first AFL goal. You know, there's been a lot of criticism about West Coast not being able to lock the ball inside fifty. So to see us lay a tackle um, and get a goal out of that was really good. Uh, I gave Hutch two votes for his job on Clayton Oliver, which we've discussed, and Jamie Cripps won. He's just, I think, you know, he's having sort of 12 possession, you know, four or five tackle games, but they're really effectual. Like that's a, mm. a great 12 possession game that we saw from Cripps. So I gave five to Elliot Yo, 14 clearances. That is a massive number. Eight inside 50s, 725 metres gained. That's 127 metres more than any other player on the ground. That's ridiculous. So, yeah, he was the best for me. I gave Gov four. I thought he was our best defender. I thought he kept us together at the back, especially in the first half. I thought he was excellent. He was the Gov of old, zoning off, reading things, marking, spoiling when he had to. Yeah, I thought he had an impressive game. Jack Redden was fantastic. I gave him the three. I thought he's not only his clearance work, but he gets around the ground really well at the moment. And he's dropping back. And it's like that Richmond game he had where he was just so impressive. And, and from the start, it's a full four-quarter four effort from Jack Redden at the moment. 30 possessions and a goal. Hutch the two for the job on Oliver. And I gave Nick one only. Um, I thought he probably lowered his colours to, to Gorn. Um, over the course of the game. Only played 61%. That's probably due to Vardy being in the team, a more traditional ruckman, obviously, so they gave him a bit more of a rest. But then the fourth quarter was huge, and we talk about the game differently because of that fourth quarter, and Nick was the main reason why. He was awesome then. So squeezes in for a vote for me as a result. So counting up the votes, Elliot Yo had 33 votes. He gets the five. Jeremy McGovern had the four. He gets 27. Um. Jack Redden, 22, gets the three. Tim Kelly with 14 gets the two. And Nick Natanui with 12 gets the one. Hutchings and Cripps were the next closest. So that means on the Nest Medal leaderboard, Nick Natanui goes out to 47 votes. Tim Kelly on 31. Jack Darling on 23, still there. Tom Barras on 21. Dom Sheed on 21. Andrew Gaff on 20. Jackie Redden jumps up to 17, closes the gap on the top group a little bit. Elliot Yo surging like the Eagles in the last term against the Demons on 16 votes. What a massive influence he's had since coming back into the team. Jeremy McGovern on 14 moves up a fair bit as well. So that is the leaderboard after this round with a couple of games to go, Drewy. And that brings us on to Western Derby, whatever it is, probably... 73 or something like that. I don't know. I've lost count. But it's a big one on the weekend. We need a win. Well, no doubt about that. I mean, if, you, uh, if you're if you purely judging our season on whether we play finals or not, then a, a win is absolutely necessary. Um, Fremantle been so up and down. Like, it, it's it's actually really hard to, to know what Dockers team is going to turn up. Now, we were. It felt like we were in pretty crappy form ahead of the last derby as well. Um, we'd just come off that big loss to Geelong, um, but we managed to to turn things around. Considering what was going on at the time, um, if you remember, I was supposed to go to that game, but there was a, a snap lockdown in Perth over the weekend before, and then yeah. more cases came out on a Saturday night, so they locked out all the fans. The Eagles probably handled all that a little bit better. It was certainly a strange build-up to a Western Derby. So hopefully uh, all goes well this time and there's going to be 60,000 in the house. Um, and we've got a pretty long winning streak. Can you remember what it's up to now? Oh, I don't know. I've lost uh, I've lost track, but it's, it's yeah, it's pretty impressive. We've got a, definitely a mental edge over them, which is significant. I think we've got a personnel edge this week, which is great too. But... Yeah, no, we've we've got the wood over there. I'm not sure exactly what the stats are are, are at. You can maybe look it up, but yeah, it's I'm I'm excited for this week. I'm actually really excited for the Derby, mainly off the back of that fourth term. We played some excellent football. Um and we can lock up a final spot with a win. It's not the most important thing in terms of where we're going, but we'd still rather play a finals game, hopefully too, than not. So let's hope they get the job done and lock it up lock it up this weekend. Yeah, so eleven straight derbies. There you go. Um so that 
dates back to, just let me scroll back. The last time Fremantle beat us was round three, 2015. They beat us by five goals. Since then, we've had a 24-point win, a 33-point win, 46, 41, 30, eight points, 58, 13, 91, 30, and 59. So there's been a few shellackings in there. So I've been back in Australia five years. The Dockers haven't beaten us once in that time. That's um, I must be a good omen. But I reckon we'll extend it again this week, Rui. I think we'll win. They've got too many players out, especially if Brayshaw misses. That's a huge blow to them. He's been their best player this season. We know that Fife's out as well and a few other key players. They're a good team. They looked a little bit jaded against Brisbane, who torched them on the weekend. I think of that fourth term with our finals chances on the line, with Shuey back, definitely. You would think Barras back definitely and maybe flying. I think we'll have too much quality and too much experience. And I think we'll put in a good performance and win. I, I haven't said that too many times this season, certainly not in the second half of the season, but I've got some confidence about us on the weekend. A lot of people will view this as a 50 50 game. I think we've got a serious edge and I think we'll we'll win it. I think we'll put in a big performance. I'm confident of a of a solid display. Yeah, I, I am too. I, I think um, it's a great platform to build off competitive game against Melbourne and a good finish as far as our performance in the last quarter. So just looking at the ladder, just to talk you through the permutations here. So the Giants and Richmond play each other and they're both behind us by a game and half a game respectively. So they've both got better percentage. So no matter what, whoever wins that game would jump ahead of us if we lost Now, St Kilda play Geelong, you would think unlikely to win that game. So they're probably not a threat this week. They're one game behind us. Essendon are a game behind after that that beating the Western Bulldogs. They would jump ahead of us if they win and they're playing the Gold Coast. So there's two spots that you would drop down. Then Fremantle would go level on points, but likely not make up enough percentage to go ahead of us. So if we lose this week, the strong likelihood is that we would drop outside the eight and then it would be de- very difficult to get back in with an away game against Brisbane on the last day of the season. So I think our finals chances do ride on this match. And if we finish in seventh spot, then we're likely to come up against either the Swans or the Lions. Just a question of how the end of their season pans out. But Garby... It would be very interesting if the Swans and West Coast played each other in the first week of the finals just to see what the AFL does about the venue given the situation with crowds and lockdowns around Australia. They would request, I have no doubt about it, Cadenia Park, the Swans. But but will there be crowds in Victoria? We don't know. We don't know. But there won't be a game in Sydney. There's no chance I'll play it in Sydney. No. So no, their home so I would suspect... Well, the Gabba or Metricon is the obvious choice for them if they if the AFL will allow them to do that and it's not in Victoria or yeah. New South Wales. Yeah. I think, yeah, if it's in Victoria, their preference would be GMHBA, which would be the worst possible result for us, I reckon, maybe even worse than the SCG, Drew. Well, I just don't want to have to make that decision again. <laughs> So that's what you'd be saying if the Swans, Geelong. You're just giving, putting one option on the table. That's where we want to play. I think that the question wouldn't even be asked. Tom Harley would just directly call <laughs> Brian Cook and say, we've, we've booked our accommodation next door. And yeah. if, you could just t- if you could just tilt the ground a little bit further in our direction, that would help. <laughs> so, I mean, let's hope it doesn't end up there because good luck. We'll be tortured, but... Anyway, we've got to get there first. We've got to beat the Dockers this week. Um, let's talk through some of the changes. So a big blow, another injury to Shannon Hearn, soft tissue. Doesn't seem like it'll keep him out for the season, but certainly this week, probably the week after, he'd probably be back to the first final, you would think. Um, so he goes out. Doug was out as well before the game, which it seems like they're unsure about that. JK's got a knock on his knee. Seems like he'll be a doubt for this week. We could have a string of changes again. Jack Petrocelli was poor. I'm sorry. Eight disposals. Didn't do enough defensively. I don't think he deserved to play to start. I can't believe that he started ahead of Zach Langdon, who I think's done 
a really good job the last month. I don't know why he was dropped. I really don't. And I think when he came on the sub, he did some nice things again as well. I don't know why they made that call, but I would be switching those two straight away. And then I think you know, Harry Edwards probably goes out for Tom Barras and Lukey Edwards maybe goes out for, for Luke Shuey. That seems like the obvious change. And then, you know, Rotham probably comes in for Hearn. I would swap Langdon and Petch. And then, you know, if Liam Ryan's in, then someone else has to drop out as well. And Jake Waterman was really unlucky to miss after the way he played, played against the Pies. So, geez, there could be five or six changes. It was a horrible decision to drop Zach Langdon. Yeah, I didn't rate it. Um, yeah, and Waterman's been playing well as well. I get that they like, – you reasoned with me a little bit over text and calmed me down because I was on a <laughs> I was on a war path after I saw those. I was, I, what was I doing? I was having a beer or something in Tokyo and just about threw up. I was just – I couldn't believe <laughs> – I couldn't believe the way that we'd gone with the final selections. Um, but – the Hutch decision was good. Jackson Nelson played a role. I just didn't think that we needed two guys like that to come in. Yeah. But Nelson for Langdon to go out, to go out uh, yeah, I, Langdon's been out, one of our only shining lights over the last sort of four to six weeks. Uh, and a slow start, but has worked his way into his Eagles career really well. Um, obviously, earns a reprieve via first the late withdrawal of Duggan and then the injury to, to Shannon Hearn. So, yeah, I think that's a pretty straightforward swap for me. I think Langdon's in and and out goes Petricelli. Whether Liam Ryan, you know, whether his inclusion would, would change any of that remains to be seen. Um, I think Waterman for Kennedy, that's that's pretty simple. And then, you know, whether they want to go with Vardy again or, or give Bailey Williams a crack. Who knows? But I, I didn't. I didn't think Vardy was that bad. No, it was. It was his best game for the season. That's not saying much, but I like it against an A grade ruckman like Gorn. I think it worked better. Um, and this week, you know, Sean Darcy's arguably Fremantle's best player this season. He's so Agreed. important to them, and he drifts forward so much. You know, we know that's not Nick's strength. He likes to play around the ball. He doesn't like to follow the opposition ruckman all over the the park because it doesn't really work for him. So. I like Vardy playing again this week and staying in the team. And then you just say to Oscar Allen, you're playing forward. He's finished off the game so well in attack. You're starting there and that's your position for four quarters. Don't worry about second rucking and and going back. Yeah, leave Oscar forward. And then Waterman can play as the third key forward when we don't have either Nick or Vardy resting up there. And And then you push him further up the ground when you've got the three tools together. Um, as you rotate, uh, assuming that Waterman comes in for Kennedy. Uh, I, I guess they've they've got a couple of decisions to make about the back line. Like if Duggan comes back in, I guess he sort of replaces Hearn. But if not, then they play Nelson as a permanent defender. They've, they'll have to do a little bit of juggling there. But obviously having Witherden in, in the team alleviates the issue of Hearn. Do they bring back Rotham? Does he fit into that mix? So a couple of decisions to make there. Mm. Um I haven't actually. I haven't seen the result of the West Coast waffle game against West Perth, so I'm not sure about talking about potential comings in from performance in the twos. But obviously, we're sort of focusing more on the guys coming back from injury, aren't we? Like, do they bring Shuey back straight in? Do you roll the dice in a derby on the skipper? Shuey, Shuey will be back. He said before the game he could have played this week, but they just thought it's not worth the risk because they might have a five day break coming up afterwards and that could maybe test him a bit too much so that has decided us yeah to be cautious and then aim for the for the derby so yeah he'll be back against the dockers which i think is really important for us and exciting ryan's the one that's up in the air duggan might miss again but it seems like barass and sure will be back ryan's the one that mm, seems 50 50 at this stage so that'll be an interesting one if he's back because then you're looking at maybe six changes from a team that finished the game really strongly which will be interesting yeah, did, uh, does Connor West hold his spot if Shuey comes back? I think so. I think they just like his grit. I think he he just brings a lot of run and, and attack. Yeah, I, th- I would say he would. I think Nelson would go out. Both Edwards would go out. Petch out, Hearn out. That's five already. Um, yeah, who are you dropping after that if you, you have to bring six in? I'm not sure. But I think Connor West, they really like him. Um, they just need someone who's just going to get their hands dirty. And they know that every time he's near the ball, he gives 100%. And I think he sets a bit of a tone in that sense. So, yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, I really like him. Uh, Connor West, to me, looks like the kind of guy you'd love to play with. Yeah. Like when, when you're lining up before the game to get no your boots frills. checked and, you, and your fingernails, you look across down the line and you see Connor West out there with the wild hair. Almost, he looks. He looks like almost like a bit of a country footballer. Socks, socks down with the hairy legs. Like you know, just just the guy you want next to you, seeing him absolutely get stuck in. Um, so I kind of like that. You know, I think every team needs a few guys like that, and I think Connor provides it. Yeah, no, I'm a fan. Cowboy West, that's the nickname. The cowboy hair and the style. I think uh, I think he's one to just keep in the team and just let him develop. I think he's giving us you know a bit more than than some others. So. Yeah, I'm all for that. All right, Drewy, um, I think that's a wrap for this week. Let's hope we beat the Dockers on the weekend. Um, really big game coming up. It'd be nice to knock them off again and just build something off the back of that fourth quarter against the Demons. And then who knows? Brisbane are up and down at the moment. We can beat the Dockers. Maybe we can go over there and cause a shock if our confidence is up and going. So I'm looking forward to the weekend. You might as well get excited at the end of the season. What else are you doing otherwise? So we know about all the crap stuff. We've spoken about it plenty, but Derby Week's all about getting pumped and hopefully knocking off the rivals and then trying to build something for the final couple of weeks. So let's hope we do so. Garby, this has been great. Hotel quarantine. It's been a nice change from looking outside the window. So appreciate that, guys. Support the Eagles hard against the Dockers. That's going to win. Forgot to get some of your Olympic recollections, mate. We'll have to do it next week because I've got next to run. Time. We'll do it next, next time. time. Thanks, buddy. All the best. at Safeway, shop the 10 for $10 produce sale. With the 10 for $10 produce sale, get items like large avocados, mangoes, green, red, orange, or yellow bell peppers, cucumbers, large lemons, or 16-ounce bags of Signature Farms baby-peeled carrots for the member price of just a dollar each. Plus, select meats like Signature Farms 80% lean ground beef and Signature Select extra meaty pork loin back ribs are buy one, get one free this week. Hurry in before these deals are gone. Visit Safeway.com for more deals. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.